Hi guys, and welcome back to the Library of Alexandria. And today, guys, today I am going to be reviewing Boosh, The Folding Knife by K.J. Parker. Now, this is one of the most interesting and different books that I have ever read. This book, I can say up front, is not for everyone. However, if you have ever been interested in the inner workings of a country and the inner workings of war and the a complete and utter case study and treatise on uh, politics and economics in a fantasy universe, this book is for you. Oh my gosh, is it detailed. And right away, that is just not for everyone. So The Folding Knife takes place in the Vasani Republic. And it is a story that follows our hero, uh, Basso the Magnificent, whose real name is Bassiano Severus. And uh, it's weird. The front of this book has Caracalla, uh, the Roman Emperor Caracalla in the background. So I thought this was going to be much more about, like, the Severans. And because, I mean, his name is, you know, Severus, and he has a similar name to uh, Caracalla's actual real name. But Basso has much more in common with the Emperor Claudius than he does Caracalla. So it's just it's just bizarre to start with. In fact, a lot of this, if you've ever read or watched the um, uh, the book or movie I, Claudia by Robert Graves, there's a lot of, or if you even know the history of the Julio Claudians, there's actually a lot he has in common with Claudius from just the very beginning that he's not attractive. It is, it was so weird to be reading a fantasy novel where the main character was ugly. Like, it specifically says that Basso is not an attractive man. He is an ugly man. He apologizes to his wife on their wedding night. Hey, he says, hey, I'm sorry, I'm sorry that I'm ugly. And that is just really weird to have a, you know, not attractive main character. So just from right off the bat, uh, the book begins 40 years in the future where we see our, our main character. He's on, he, he loses... Uh, the stagecoach that he's riding on top of hits a bump and he loses the folding knife he has in his hand that's, you know, really fancy. And he loses it. And it's called the folding knife because of events that kind of stem from uh, the origins and the usage of said knife. And the back of the book says he only makes one mistake. And it's not the mistake that you think it is. Like, early on, and even in the, in the prologue, you think that it's a specific mistake, but it's not really that. He makes a different mistake and it, you know... Sometimes one mistake is enough, as the back of the book says. And so after that, we we plot Basso's birth, really all the way through his rise and uh, his career as a politician, and mostly as first citizen, which is kind of like the consul of, of ancient Rome. There were two of them. He's kind of like the president of the Republic, because this world that he inhabits is some kind of combination between ancient Rome and uh, the kind of mercantile states of uh, of Italy where we have the Medici family kind of running everything. It's, it's, it's a weird blend of those two things. And it is just extremely Roman in just like, not only like the place names, but also like their names. Everyone's name is extraordinarily Roman, guys. And there's a lot of them. And sometimes it's hard to keep it straight. In fact, one of the most challenging things about this book is the fact that there's no map. And there's a lot of place names and a lot of uh, people's names. And keeping track of that, if you don't have kind of a background in like basic Roman history, I think this book would be much, much more difficult to follow. It's not impossible, but much more challenging than I had just because I'm used to seeing all these names that are similar and kind of understanding the, the structure of the Roman Republic. Uh, but the place names and the fact there's no map, that is challenging. And he's, Parker is really good at this world building because the the world that Basso and the, and the Vasani Republic live in feels extremely real. And they reference places and they reference like historical events that have happened with, uh, you know, conflicts with these other places that aren't really uh, key to this story. But he just throws out these, these place names as if the Vasani Republic has this real history behind it. Uh, that, you know, if anyone in the Republic would know, we just don't know. And he doesn't need to flesh it out because we're really kind of following it from Basso's perspective. And so the focus of this book, weirdly, is not Basso as a person as much as Basso's career and his reputation. He is very, very careful uh, in his uh, political and career decisions and the decisions to protect his legacy and his reputation. Uh, Basso is not a good man. He is extremely smart. This is one of the most intelligent main characters 
I've ever read. And it actually shows him being brilliant as opposed to us just being told that he's brilliant. I hate it in books. There's a lot of this going around in fantasy books where we're told how smart the character is and then they don't actually do anything that shows how smart they are. This is not the case with Basso. If you want a primer on brilliant characters, The Folding Knife is something to read because he's not a great person. He's a, really kind of a sociopath, extremely Machiavellian. Uh, he is not socially adept. He is a bad husband, a bad father, a bad son, a bad brother, a bad friend. He's not really any of those good at any of those things, but he is a brilliant politician and a brilliant economist and a brilliant banker. In fact, one of the central areas of this book is his control of the, uh, the charity bank and trust, which is this bank that his dad buys uh, in the beginning of the book and that he inherits and the running of that bank is central. Like I said before, this is extremely detailed in its civil and economic administration of, uh, a, a, of a country. We learn the inner workings of buying, selling, stocks, uh, trading, shipping, grain supply, shipbuilding, administering during plague, a, a colonialism, expansion. And it's all very, very in-depth. It's just extremely detailed, like, logistical stuff. Uh, and, and Basso is just a genius as he navigates this. Like he's got a ship, he's got a, he plays some like, you know, economic game here to increase uh, these funds later. He has just this really, really long-term, uh, long-term vision. And everything from really the writing style to just kind of the tone is, is just very Machiavellian. Uh, everything Basso does, we see him react not like in his personal life. We don't really see any personal reactions. It's all a reaction to how it's gonna affect his reputation and how it's gonna affect his job as the first citizen of the Vasani Republic. It's a very kind of impersonal story while at the same time being weirdly personal. It's like Basso doesn't have an identity outside owner of the bank and first citizen. And it's just all very insincere like we see him talk about needing to start a war for the sole purpose that no one expects their country to. And about, uh, I, I always, you've, you've seen me talk about how I really love when governments kind of use propaganda to make people believe things. That isn't, I, I just love that kind of exploration. And Basso is the pro at propagandizing the things that he does. He always turns anything he does into just this kind of boon. And he always makes his opponents, the optimates, uh, because in the in the Roman um, in the Roman Senate and the Republic, there were kind of really two political parties. Really, uh, I mean that's oversimplifying. But there's the, you have the Populares of which uh, Basso and Caesar were members of, and then you have the Optimates, who were you know the the conservatives that uh, want to kind of preserve the the Constitution, the Republic, how it is. And Basso uh, is is constantly trying to like you know screw over uh, the Optimates and. The only kind of personal relationships that he has are with um, his tutor, his mentor at the bank, uh, who was his mentor when he was before he took over when his dad owned the bank, and Ilias, who is this foreign, uh, this general who's not a citizen, but he is uh, the general, kind of like Agrippa for Augustus. He wins all of uh, wins all of Basso's wars for him, and then his nephew Bassano, and that's really his most personal relationship. Uh, especially considering Basso doesn't really like even his own sons because they're, you know, morons. And his sister hates his guts. Guys, it, it, I, I have never seen a relationship like Basso and his sister. She hates him, every fiber of his being. In fact, she hates Basso more than she loves her son Bassano. And it is bizarre to see the lengths that his sister will go to kind of try to ruin him. And Basso kind of lets her get away with a bunch of things because he, he loves his sister, even though she hates his guts. Um, as far as Parker's writing style, I, I mentioned that the narrative voice is just as kind of Machiavelli and, and kind of acerbic. It's, uh, it has this very kind of humorous tone, but it's kind of like this... Uh, cynical humor rather than like Pratchett's like amusing humor. It's, it's, it's definitely, he definitely has a distinctive or authorial voice. And he often asks us to kind of fill in the blanks, 
Um, he doesn't spell everything out. You really have to kind of think as you're reading this book and fill in some kind of implied gaps. For example, he'll mention something about, uh, Basso will, will address the Senate, uh, mentioning something about raising taxes on like the, the, the excessively wealthy. And rather than having him, hit, rather than Parker saying that, oh, everyone screamed and objected and whatever, the next, the, the very next line will be when he was able to be heard again, which I really like because he's telling you that everyone object, objected vociferously and was screaming against it without actually saying that. When, when he could be heard again implies that they were all yelling and he could not be heard prior to this next line. So he does a lot of that, which I, I, I really, really like. Basso likes to say, uh, best deal I ever made, which he got from his, his dad. His dad is kind of like this, uh, his dad was lucky, not quite as lucky as Basso is. Everyone acknowledges Basso's like incredible good fortune. But his dad was always like, you know, he's the guy who always had like get rich quick schemes. And they, you know, sometimes they worked out, sometimes they didn't. But he'd always be like, best deal I ever made. He came home and bought a bank. And he said, best deal I ever made. And his wife is like, infuriated but this was kind of the, this was the best deal he ever made buying this bank and so basso still still says that he'll buy like a shipyard and be like best deal i ever made and the other thing that he says and this is kind of a theme throughout the entire book is uh is that war or violence is the admission of failure meaning if you've had to resort to war or you've had to resort to violence you have admitted uh that you cannot achieve any you cannot achieve your end by any other means so it a lot of times says and it takes on a different meaning depending on the context it talks about war or violence being that admission of failure. And it's really, really cool to see what Parker does with that theme there. It's just, like, it's just so incredible to see uh, just the kind of takes on running a country that Parker gets. This is one of the most interesting books I've ever read. Uh, despite Basso not being really likable, like, you're rooting for Basso, except that you feel bad for rooting for him because he's a complete and utter sociopath. He's constantly giving Ilias, his general, these really extravagant, expensive, uh, one-of-a-kind, unique gifts that nobody wants. Like, anyone besides Ilias would, like, be, like, amazed at these gifts. But for Ilias specifically, he doesn't want them. It's all, it just, like, gives him, like, this, like these triumphs, and Ilias doesn't want it, or these, like, really rare books that Ilias, that are awesome, but Ilias doesn't want, or, like, you know, giving him, giving him citizenship, which he, then he can then join p the political, uh, the political race, and Ilias doesn't want any of this stuff, and it's all this other stuff, there's all this stuff that other people would covet, but, and, but Ilias talks about, like, he has just this really, this, this real talent for giving, uh, really incredible gifts that nobody wants. Uh, because Ilias believes, and again, this is one of these things that he explores about the running of a country. Ilias doesn't believe that soldiers have any place in the government. He doesn't think that the people who are going to go and fight and be thrown at the enemy should not have an opinion in politics. Their job is to soldier and their job is on the battlefield. It is not their job to, like, you know, get involved in the running. There's just two separate skill sets. And Ilias wants, doesn't want to be anywhere near politics. He doesn't even vote. He doesn't even think that he, he should be able to, to vote in this freaking thing. And Basso has, he has this absolutely amazing luck. It's kind of like the luck that Caesar had. Like, every, every historian who ever wrote about Caesar acknowledges that Caesar was incredibly lucky in so many of his endeavors. And Basso has a lot of that luck. And he has this ability, and everyone always comments on, no matter what goes wrong, Basso has this way of turning it into this boon, into this advantage. It's like even stuff he fails at, he ends up succeeding at, even when he doesn't mean to. And it, this is more of the cynical kind of worldview. Parker is a very, an extremely talented writer, but it does have kind of a cynical tone. There's one time where someone is talking to Basso about kind of the fringe benefits. Like, he brings these positive changes to the country without really even meaning to. That's the thing. This is the person talking to Basso. You add, you add on getting rid of starvation and poverty like it's a fringe benefit, like the slice of lemon you get with a plate of white bait. He laughed. That's why I succeed, he said, where men with beautiful souls always fail. If you walk through the market asking the stall holders to give you a slice of lemon for free, they'd laugh in your face. Pay for the white bait, however, and you get a good meal of white bait for your money plus the free lemon. So he, he's talking about like, you know, he doesn't ask the Senate uh, to, you know, provide like free food for the poor and, and free housing and things like that for, for the poor. Instead, 
he does something else and he ends up getting those things as kind of a fringe benefit. And he's like, well, people like me, because every decision he makes is a political, is a political decision. People try to assassinate him and he doesn't, he doesn't even go after them because political decisions, like when Antony refused to go after the, the assassins of Caesar, everything he does is a political decision. So he's not a good person. He doesn't go for these things that men with beautiful souls go for. He doesn't try to cure society's ills. Instead, he's self-interested and tries to, uh, you know, affect his reputation and increase his money, but ends up making things better for the poor people as an afterthought. It's just so hard to root for him because he does these great things, but he doesn't do them on purpose. I mean, again, again, with this kind of cynical attitude, uh, like, uh, Basso at one point, like, has this really harebrained idea and he asks his chancellor, he's like, hey, chancellor, what do you think of this idea? And he's like, well, I hate it, but I'm going to support you anyway. And Basso's like, if you hate the idea, why are you going to support me? He's like, well, I like being chancellor. And if I don't support it, I won't be. Because he knows that if he doesn't support it, Basso will replace him. And that is so, it is so much like real politics about the favors you have to do and about how people, you know, don't act on their beliefs because they just like being in power. Guys, if you don't want a real look at what real politics is like, you should not read this book. It is tough sometimes. And that goes into kind of like the way that Parker describes things from a war to kind of the, uh, the treasury being attacked or, or the, the city being attacked, anything like that. He describes with this very kind of like pulled back, like documentarian style. He just recites these events as they're happening as if it was kind of a report being read back to Basso uh, after the fact. And it's really bizarre in what is like micro focused on versus what is macro focused on. It is, again, this is one of the most fascinating books I've ever read. We experience these, these uh, big events from like an outside lens rather than experience it from any of the character's perspectives. But this is anyone, anyone, I can recommend this book to anyone. If you are interested, in improving your writing about world building and economies and like the fight, how much it actually costs to go to war. I have seen this so rarely, the actual financial cost of declaring war on somebody. In fantasy books, they just declare war, it's what it is. Like this goes into like how much it bloody costs and the, 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 just the financial toll it takes on two nations. If you are interested in world building and, um, and trade and economies of, of various countries, you need to read this. This would be such a good resource for you if you are trying to write those things into your own uh, writing. So the book is really well plotted. Um, it is not really exciting. Again, we're watching the, 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 the drama comes from Basso's rise and the fall that we know is coming because from the prologue, we know that that's his straits after 40 years, but we don't know how he's going to get there. And so that's really, that's really the drama. It has a very kind of bleak outlook. It's not like a feel good book really. Um, and some of the, the themes it explores are colonialism and expansion and empire about how in, the imperialists think that uncivilized means anyone that isn't like them. Uh, the barbarians are anybody who aren't the Vasani Republic, right? Like, like, that's, that's the definition of uncivilized. And Basso's Republic is a really interesting blend of kind of like the, the political right and political left of our day. Uh, there's a lot of both of that in there. Um, it asks a lot about the reason. They talk about the reason that we do things, the reason that humankind uh, does things, the reason that individuals do things, a about how there's always a good reason. We can always provide several reasons. And you know, some of those reasons may even be good, but they're not the reason. When you strip everything away, what is the actual motive behind everything that you do? And as a character study with Basso, this is a story of hubris and self-aggrandizement, of sides, whatever side you're on in a conflict being more important than anything else. Uh, then it's more important than family, it's more important than blood, it's more important than friends. You pick a side and that's the side you're on. And we watch uh, Basso's hubris and his self-promotion. And most interestingly, at its core, The Folding Knife is about what it means to be a good man. Is Basso a good man? He did many, 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 many good things. Many good things. But is he a good man? He had to do a lot of repulsive things. 
And you see that uh, the best relationship in this book is between Vasso and his nephew, where he tries to make uh, Bassano a good man. He wants um, Bassano to kind of take over for him after he's gone, but he wants Bassano, he wants to leave a world where Bassano doesn't have to make the choices that Basso has made. And it's really, really good. Guys, this is unlike any book I've ever read. On the Kingfin approval system, I give this book a... Uh, you know what? I'm going to give this book a, a, a superb minus. This I really, really like this book. The fact that um, it was hard to really care a lot about the characters. The, the plot of this book is fascinating. The way he writes is fascinating. I give this four and a half stars out of five. It just lacked something kind of like Poppy War and Red Rising that keep me from being one of my favorites is it's no one's really very likable. Ilias, I like Ilias, the general, he's, he's the best. He's just like, I guess, you know, is what I do, I'm a general. I, if any of this sounds interesting, please read it. It'll be unlike anything you've ever read. Um, but it is about the economy and politics. If you don't like those things, then maybe you'll find the character study of Basso interesting. I strongly recommend this book. I definitely want to read more of Parker if this is indicative of his writing style. It's a standalone too, guys. Excellent, excellent book. Guys, that's all from me for today. As always, information about my Patreon and Discord is down in the description. Come and join the Vasani slash Alexandria Republic. And I'll see you next time, guys.